Welcome everyone to this week's data science seminar at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. I'm David Bader and I direct the Institute for Data Science at NJIT. We're pleased today to be joined by a very distinguished speaker, Dr. Helen Berman, who will be speaking about building community resources for structural biology. It's a pleasure to have Dr. Berman today. Dr. Helen Berman is a Board of Governors Distinguished Professor Emerita of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at Rutgers University, also in New Jersey. Her research has focused on nucleic acids, protein nucleic acid interactions, and collagen. Dr. Berman was a co-founder of the Protein Data Bank, or PDB, that was launched in 1971 and has been committed to the continued development and maintenance of this community resource. Major accomplishments on this journey include taking leadership roles in establishing the nucleic acid database in 1992, the Research Collaboratory for Structural Bioinformatics Protein Data Bank in 2000, the Worldwide Protein Data Bank in 2003, the Structural Biology Knowledge Base in 2008, and the Unified Data Resource for 3D Electron Microscopy in 2007. Dr. Berman is a member of the American Academy for Arts and Sciences, and she's a fellow of the Biophysical Society, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a fellow of the American Crystallographic Association, and a fellow of the International Society for Computational Biology. She's a recipient of several major awards including the Benjamin Franklin Award for Open Access in the Life Sciences, the Delano Award for Computational and Biosciences, the ACA Martin Berger and David Rogney Awards, and the Distinguished Service Award from the Biophysical Society and the Carl Brandon Award from the Protein Society. Thank you for speaking, Dr. Berman. Thank you very much, thank you. To my great surprise, as I was preparing this uh, seminar on uh, Monday, I discovered uh, this article in the New York Times uh, talking about um, a protein production, a protein prediction uh, algorithm that worked. Uh, then got emails from several friends, one of which was Eddie Arnold, who's at uh, Rutgers. Wow, DeepMind solving the protein folding problem. And then a message from my son, which I have to tell you was very rare. Uh, he's saying, is this for real? Top headline at BBC. Uh, as you'll see as I go through this, this basically uh, is a, a confirmation of a great dream that I had 50 years ago that we could actually have such a thing happen. And I'll explain this to you uh, later in the seminar, but it was the motivation, uh, one of the many motivations for starting the Protein Data Bank. So uh, in structural biology uh, began in the 19, actually it began in, in about 19, 35, but we began to see some results in the 50s with the structure of DNA, the famous uh, model by Watson, Crick, and Franklin, uh, the structure of myoglobin, uh, small protein. Uh, both of these uh, uh, discoveries won Nobel Prize. But now, in, uh, as time has uh, gone on, we are beginning to look at structures of very complex um, uh, uh, complex machines uh, in the cell, and here's an example, and then actually starting to look at the cell itself. So structural biology has gone from um, modest and at the time quite ambitious beginnings to where we are now. So in the early days of structural biology um, uh, began in Cambridge in England uh, the father of the field really is J.D. Bernal, who was a Cambridge crystallographer, uh, who not only um, was a, a brilliant scientist, but he had some very strong views about data sharing, about uh, being uh, a good citizen in science. Uh, and that permeated the field. And I, as, you, as I go through my talk, you'll see what I'm talking about. 
Uh, one of his students was uh, Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin, uh, who at the time was in Cambridge, and she was the first person to crystallize a protein and get an X-ray diffraction pattern. Uh, she then went on to Oxford where she ran a lab. Uh, and of course she won a Nobel prize for her brilliant discoveries. Uh, John Kendrew and Max Perutz, also in Cambridge, uh, were crystallographers and uh, they did the first structure, first of myoglobin and then of hemoglobin uh, in the 50s. And so this was the beginning of the whole uh, work in structural biology. Um, so the, here are the, some of the first structures is, and I'm showing them deliberately in different representations because I think that's something uh, crystallographers um, love to think about how to represent molecules. And I'm not going to talk about this now, but I mentioned to David that in the current work that I'm doing is in is in film and trying to figure out how exactly we can represent molecules in new ways from the ones you're seeing here. So on the left is myoglobin, uh, which is a, a responsible for carrying oxygen. Hemoglobin also carries oxygen. Lysozyme, uh, a small protein uh, that was uh, determined in um, by uh, David Phillips. And then finally, there's an American protein, uh, which is um, ribonuclease. And that was determined in 1967. Uh, and that was a, a really um, big deal for the Americans who were feeling very left out of this whole uh, uh, important work going on in protein crystallography. And uh, so ribonuclease was done by two labs, one in Buffalo and one in Yale. Okay, so there were the structures. That was one really important thing. We actually had three-dimensional structures of proteins that we could look at. But in addition, there was the whole thing about protein folding and how exactly do proteins get the shape that they have. And the two really leading lights in this um, were uh, Chris Amphenson, who uh, realized that the uh, sequence uh, determines structure, that there's something in the sequence of a protein that leads to its three-dimensional shape. Uh, and th this was an extremely important uh, uh, discovery. And then there was Cyrus Leventhal, who for, was at uh, MIT, and actually worked with what was called Project MAC. Uh, you'll see in the, um, uh, this was one of the first graphics computers that you could actually visualize a protein. And there was this trackball that you used to, to rotate the um, molecule on the screen. It was all black and white. And Cyrus is shown here uh, in front of a, 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 looking at some computer output. And, and Cyrus was, really uh, uh, intrigued by the whole concept of protein folding. Like, how does it actually do that? And how does, how does a protein fold so fast? And so, because there's so many degrees of freedom and that was the Leventhal paradox. So I was being trained during this period where these first structures were coming out and then there were people like Amphenson saying that sequence makes structure and then there were people uh, then there was Cyrus Leventhal saying that we need to understand protein folding. How does the sequence lead to the structure? How does that actually happen? And so this was some, this was part of my training and my understanding. Um, and the, uh, those pictures so far were in the sixties. Uh, a group of us back then, uh, when you wanted to get anything done, you, uh, had a march and he had a protest. <laughs> you demanded things, you wrote petitions. So we wrote a petition. I'm, I have to tell you, I have no idea who we thought was going to read this petition, in which we said that uh, there needed to be a place where all these structures could be placed so that people could share the data. Now you have to remember back then the data were stored on punched cards. 
so a, a protein structure or a couple of boxes of punched cards that you couldn't drop or do anything bad to. And the question is, how do you get those data around? How do you, how do you, how do you make an archive in that era? Um, and, but we really thought this was very important. If you look at this, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, petition that we wrote, my name is a little bit down here, about fifth or sixth or seventh in the list. Uh, and we, uh, we really thought this was important. So we went to, we uh, went to the Cold Spring Harbor meeting in 1971, almost 50 years ago. Uh, which was a meeting that Jim Watson ran on uh, protein crystallography, which is really rather extraordinary. If any of you uh, follow the history of the structure of DNA, he wasn't exactly a big fan of X-ray crystallography, but nonetheless, he ran this meeting. The meeting was amazingly exciting. We had all the famous people uh, doing this kind of work. I was... Uh, Still, uh, uh, I, by that point, I guess I was a postdoc. Um, we crashed the meeting because it was invitation only, but we knew it was happening. So we just went and again, it was all part of that culture. And at the meeting, we met somebody named Walter Hamilton, uh, who was a crystallographer at Cold Spring Harbor. And his picture is shown here, talking to Hal Wyckoff, who had done the structure of um, ribonuclease. And uh, we were very serious, those of us who approached Walter, and we said, we need to have a protein data bank. What are you going to do to make us have a protein data bank? And he said, I'll do it. That was it. So he uh, got on an airplane, went to England, because as you could hear from the beginning, that was the center of uh, protein crystallography. He made an agreement with somebody named Alga Kanad, who was archiving small molecule structures, and uh, they, in, in five months after that meeting, the Protein Data Bank was established. And, and this paper was published in October of, two, of uh, 1971. And uh, here's a picture of Walter. I think this might have been in July or August of 1971, myself, when I had long dark hair instead of short gray hair, and Tom Ketzel. The sad thing about this picture is Walter died a few months after this picture was taken. Uh, Tom, who was his postdoc, took over the PDB at that point. Um, so the PDB went along as a kind of grassroots, it was definitely a grassroots effort. Um, we, uh, many of us helped almost as volunteers to make it all happen. Tom wrote personal letters to people asking them to deposit data. Um, and everything was going along just fine until the mid 80s. And in the mid 80s, uh, uh, the uh, AIDS epidemic came along, which was uh, a horrible, a horrible uh, epidemic. And that wasn't, it wasn't quite an epidemic, but um, among one group of people it was. And uh, it was a very serious health problem. NIH said, uh, somebody from the NIH named Marvin Kasman said, um, I'm not funding any structural biology in this area uh, unless I can be sure that all the data are public. So the community came together. We contacted journal editors. Um, we set up committees to establish policies and standards. Uh, we, there was a, a, another grassroots uh, group from Yale headed by um, uh, Fred Richards, who um, said all, it was a moral imperative for all these structures to be made public. And then Dick Dickerson, who at the time was, I think at UCLA, uh, was very angry that all the structures were not all available. Uh, the committees that were set up set up a set of standards. And once those standards are, were set up, then the funding agencies were uh, able to um, uh, insist that all the structures be uh, put into the public repository. So those were the, that was the establishment of the deposition guidelines. The next thing that was important uh, 
it, what that we thought was important once we had that data uh, was we needed to have data standards. Uh, as many of you might know, what's the good of a bunch of data that has no metadata that you don't know what's in there, it just becomes a data dump. And so there was a group of people, again, this crystallographic community, remember I told you that, that um, uh, J.D. Bernal was a leading figure back when, and one of his whole things was about sharing and about collaborating and about basically having a, a certain a set of values that would encourage open science, which I think you're all used to now, but it wasn't always that way. So a group got together to set up a, a format that was machine readable. It was called the Macromolecular Crystallographic Information Format. And it had all the definitions of all the data from crystallographic experiments. Um, and uh, it had all, you know, it, it was very complete. I think there were about three or 4,000 definitions. And these were carefully done by a group of people that included myself and led by uh, Paula Fitzgerald, who used to be at Merck, is now retired, Phil Bourne, who you may know, John Westbrook, uh, Shoshana Vodak, and Sid Hall. And we worked really hard to get these data standards. So that was 1996 that we had the first draft. Uh, and uh, you would think, okay, now we have it. Well, you have to get the community again to agree. Not everybody wants to do things the way they're told to do them, right? So uh, we had to work very hard. And the key to this whole thing was working with the software developers who were using, or who were writing the programs that people used for structural biology. Uh, and so we had a meeting in 2011 at the European Bioinformatics Institute where we um, uh, talked about, we said, look, if you don't like SIF, we'll give you any format you want, just agree on something. And whatever you agree on, we will work with. And the, we being the PDB. Um, and uh, to our great surprise, uh, that that meeting, even though they had been fighting about various details of, of the syntax and, and uh, of MMSIF and various aspects, they said, this is stupid. You have all the libraries, we're gonna do it. And so this group shown here agreed to use SIF as the um, master format. And that then allowed us to, uh, to have all the data that was being uh, generated and worked on with all the different programs that exist that allowed us to be able to um, have a single format that we could all count on and we knew what we were dealing with. Uh, the other aspect of all of this has to do with making sure everything is global. Uh, we felt very strongly that there needed to be a single uh, uh, PDB. It couldn't be an American PDB and an English PDB and a Japanese PDB. So we uh, formed something called the Worldwide PDB to ensure that the data are freely and globally uh, available. Uh, we would collaborate on all aspects of data processing and annotation and we would keep to the same standards. We did say that anybody could have any kind of website that they wanted to have. Uh, and that's what we've done. So the, it doesn't matter where you get the PDB data from, it will always be the same uh, around the world. And that uh, we've been operating that way since 2003. And so there's the worldwide PDB, there's the RCSB PDB, which is the one uh, that's the American uh, version. There's the um, uh, PDBE in Europe and PDBJ in Japan, and then another group called BMRB that has to do with NMR data. Finally, um, <clears throat> although we had the coordinates of all these molecules, which told us the shape, how do we know that it's even right? Supposing somebody made some kind of a mistake. 
So we, um, there was a lot of pushing, again, a lot of community involvement saying that we needed to have um, the primary experimental data archived also. And again, people weighed in as to what they thought was required. Uh, and then finally in 2008, we required experimental data to be part, the, the, the primary data from which these coordinates are derived to also be part of the uh, PDB. And now that is the case. So in addition to the X-ray crystallography, which was the beginning of all of this, uh, it was, it was, it's still the majority of structures are determined using X-ray crystallography. At the end of my talk, you'll see that that may not happen anymore, but let's continue. Uh, uh, the, another key method is cryo-electron microscopy, which allows you to look at very large structures using electron microscopy. And this is just a uh, collage of a few such uh, structures to show you the diversity of the structures and, and how complex they are. Uh, this was a project um, that again began in England, uh, but in this case, um, we formed a collaboration so that we would share the ways in which all these data are curated. Um, and there was a lot of community input on how to manage these data because these data are not the same as x-ray. And so we had all these different groups get together over a period of years talking about how to represent the data, how to validate the data. And to this day, we continue to do that because it is very complex. We wanna make sure that not only are we collecting the data, but people have some idea of how good the data are. Uh, you can see that the growth in uh, EM uh, data is, is very large. Uh, it's, it's an extremely important method, especially these days in um, the COVID pandemic. Uh, there's been a lot of work on the, uh, using electron microscopy to define all the different parts of uh, the coronavirus. And we then formed, uh, several years ago, we formed a, a resource that gives us not only the structures, but all the standards, any news, uh, any kind of validation, since we're developing validation methodologies, all of that is presented at this uh, resource. And again, this is an international uh, collaboration. Uh, and then as we thought, well, we, we, we had pretty much everything we needed there emerged a new kind of methodology um, called uh, to produce what are called integrative structures. And these are structures that are determined not by a single method. In other words, not by uh, say just X-ray or NMR or EM, but by lots of different methods, lots of different pieces. Um, and we have to somehow bring all of these data together using computational methods to come up with a model. And these structures had begun to be done several years ago and nobody actually knew quite what to do with them. And because the PDB was designed uh, to look at only single method structures, um, we needed a way to archive all of this information and make it freely available. Um, so this is a, a slide that shows you how you take all these different methods, you get some initial structures, you take all the spatial constraints that come from these different methods and you get an ensemble of the optimized structures. And this is the, the general methodology. Okay, so how are we gonna archive all this stuff? Again, we brought together the experts in the field of the different experimental methods, as well as the computational methods, as well as the archiving methods. Kind of the leader of this whole thing is Andre Sali at UCSF, uh, sort of the master integrative modeler, but all of these people have played all different important roles in figuring out what to do. Um, at the end of that, meet, uh, that meeting, which was in 2014, we came up with some recommendations for uh, 
how to, uh, that saying that these models must be archived, there needs to be a flexible model representation. We have to have a way to assess the uncertainty. We realized that you can't put all the data from all the methods into one place. So we decided that it had to be a federated model for doing this uh, and that we had to have publication standards. So that was the recommendations for that. Um, the challenges are that there are these diverse types of data. There's complexity for data. There's a lot of complexity involved in the data deposition, the validation, the, the bio curation. So we had to deal with multi-scale, multi-state ordered ensembles and figure out how are we gonna represent all of that in some kind of way that is going to allow uh, people to both deposit the data. And then once the data are deposited, uh, people have to be able to um, access the data and understand the data. So uh, we formed uh, a set of, uh, we formed some projects to do that. Um, and we have um, the input data sets um, from different external data, uh, bases. We have the data sets a reference via a DOI. We have the starting component, uh, component models and then the spatial restraints from the experiments. And all of this has to be uh, put together. In order to do this, based on our past experience, we had to come up with a data dictionary. We chose in doing this to use a dictionary that was based on the syntax of the um, uh, MMCIF, but it would have to contain a lot more information. So the MMCIF now is called PDBX, taking into account all the different methodologies that are being represented. Uh, we have special tags if it's something is only for one method and no other. So some things are the same, no matter what the method is, such as the geometry, the distances and the angles and things like that. Whereas other things are very specific to specific methods. So this dictionary was all put together. This work began in about 2015 after we wrote the white paper. Uh, the person who put this data dictionary together for um, integrative models is a Brenda Vellette, who's at Rutgers uh, and working closely uh, in a collaborative project with uh, Andre Sali at UCSF. Um, uh, two or three years into the project, we came up with a prototype for this whole system that allows us to um, archive these models. And we call it um, PDB Dev for development. Uh, it is meant to disappear because the whole idea going forward will be that once we understand what we're doing and we figure out exactly how to represent these molecules and how to process them and validate them, they will become a regular part of the PDB. But until we did that, we needed a separate platform in order to make that happen. And uh, that's what uh, PDB Dev is. So that was a, a important. So what I've shown you so far, I think, uh, is that we, in every case, we needed to take the experts in the field in each field that we were dealing with, bring them together, get their input and figure out how to get all of the validation standards for all these different kinds of methods done in some kind of coherent way. So some people were on pretty much all of these tasks. We formed task forces. Uh, some people are on multiple task forces. The task forces still exist and still meet. Um, and they, it's a process. And as, as we get through each step of the way, we publish a paper that says where we are. And so it's peer reviewed and people can argue about whether we are doing it the right way or not. And we continue to run all of these meetings. Okay, so 
the PDB today. So I've just shown you all of these different pieces that came together from starting from a few people saying there has to be a place to put all these structures. Um, so we have the science. Right now, there's more than 170,000 structures of nucleic acids, proteins, and large macromolecular machines. Uh, we have an archival database with worldwide distribution sites. And the community of users is really huge, as I'll show you very soon. Uh, lots of people use these data and they count on these data. Um, so normally this is where I feel happy to tell you, uh, look at all these people who use it. But on Tuesday, uh, my dream back in 1967 was that there would be a knowledge-based way of predicting protein structures. And the only way we could have that knowledge is if we had the protein structures all in one place. So on Tuesday, I'm uh, sorry, on Monday, um, there was the announcement from um, uh, AlphaFold, uh, which is this uh, project as part of uh, the whole Google network. Uh, it's called DeepMind. Uh, and uh, the, the, what it is is a, uh, a AI method to predict protein structures. Now, people have been trying to predict protein structures since uh, Cyrus Leventhal first said that it was a problem that we needed to address. And um, so the idea was to somehow take the data from the PDB and use it to predict an unknown structure. So for many years, there's been a, they don't like to use the word competition, but it was a competition uh, where uh, people would try to predict structures uh, that of, of proteins that were not yet released from the PDB. So there was always a few structures held behind just long enough for the CASP competition to predict the structure. Uh, and uh, every year, lots of really brilliant minds got together trying to predict these structures, and they did pretty well uh, until Google came along and said, we can do it better. Uh, they didn't say that, but that's what they thought, and they were right. And so uh, a couple of years ago, uh, they won the CASP competition. Uh, and they were like dark horses because nobody, everybody with all of some of the most brilliant minds in uh, protein structure were trying to predict structures and they did pretty well, but uh, Google did better. Uh, and then there was this announcement Now the paper has not been published. So we don't really know what they did yet, but I took this from the website that they, we trained the system on publicly available data consisting of 170,000 protein structures from the protein data bank. And I was really annoyed that they used a small p, a small d, a small b. But then when I uh, clicked on it, I found our website. So that made me really, really happy, uh, together with large databases containing the sequences of unknown structure. We don't I actually know whether they really did as well as they said they did. We won't know until the paper is published. But if they didn't quite do it yet, they're very close. And this is uh, an enormously important development because it means we'll be able to uh, not, it will be much easier to get structures. And even if, for example, we can only get half the structures we wanna get, that's better than all of the work that has to go in now to determining a structure experimentally. Uh, as I said, uh, I have not yet seen the paper and nobody has. And so we don't know for sure how good this is, but it looks pretty impressive from what they have said. Um, so just to give you a sense of the metrics, uh, there are about 13,000 structures deposited every year. Uh, the bio curation responsibilities are distributed by geography so the structures that come into Europe are processed in Europe, the ones to America are processed in New Jersey, uh, and then uh, and, and the ones from Asia are, are processed in, in Japan. Um, and that works very, very 
uh, well. Uh, there are 2.4 million data files downloaded every day. What I mean by a data file is the data that contains all the coordinates. So any structure contains a very large number of coordinates and there are 2.4 million data files downloaded every day. Now, uh, when, I, uh, when I was allowed to be in a lab in New Jersey, we had a board which showed the depositions as they were coming in. And I noticed that there was a huge amount of activity in a small number of cities. And I said, somebody's doing something really big with these data. What are they doing? And people said, oh, come on, come on. I said, look at these numbers. That makes no sense. And now it's clear what was going on now that I've seen this, this press release. Uh, the PDB data is used very heavily for drug development, uh, uh, you cannot, uh, all the pharmaceutical companies download PDB da data pretty much every week or every month, depending on the company. And they use those data for figuring out uh, targets. And uh, the, if you remember, I said that when the AIDS epidemic began, uh, one of the key issues was um, making sure those data were available for drug development. And they, of course they were. Uh, and uh, as many of you might know, uh, HIV is now a chronic disease rather than a killer disease. And that's because of all these drugs that were developed and they were developed specific in a very rational way uh, using the data uh, from the PDB. Um, so here's a picture for David Goodsell. Uh, David is, um, a he's a crystallographer by training, but he's also a, a molecular artist. And David uh, has drawn this poster. This is second or third edition of this poster showing the molecular machinery and a tour of the PDB. And the structures are um, uh, divided according to function. And uh, you can download this from the RCSB site, which I'll show you a little bit later. Uh, and you can look at these structures and there's an interactive version. So you could actually learn a little bit of structural biology and molecular biology just by looking at this poster. Uh, the PDB growth uh, continues to be uh, very impressive. Uh, you will notice in the case, uh, I divided it, this particular picture in terms of X-ray structures, NMR and EM. Uh, X-rays still dominate, um, NMR, not so much, but look at what's going on with uh, EM. EM is, is uh, uh, enormously productive uh, and I don't see any end in sight uh, in the very near future. Um, reuse, in order to think about, uh, some of you may know about the FAIR principles, but you want to know, are your data actually being used? Well, we know they're being used or they're being downloaded, but it's the PDB data uh, are being used by over 200 biological databases. So there are value-added uh, databases, boutique databases that take PDB data and make special for special cases. And, and uh, it's being used by about 200 of such um, uh, databases. Since 2011, 25% of new databases uh, utilize PDB data. So 119 out of 452 new databases are using PDB data. So PDB data is very um, heavily used by all sorts of people. And we have done analyses to figure out who is, what are they doing with these data? And some of it's pretty interesting. We actually went back to some of the articles to see what people were doing. So even if you're not interested in biology, the data are so rich and so well annotated, you can do almost any experiment you would like, to, any computer experiment you would like to do just by working with these data. Um, there was a, the primary RCSB PDB uh, publication that uh, when, when the Protein Data Bank moved from Brookhaven to uh, Rutgers and UCSD in um, 1999, and we published a paper um, that has now been cited, I don't know, it's here, uh, 
I think it's about 20,000 times uh, this particular paper. And we, uh, we've done a lot of analyses as to what people are doing with this paper, why. And they're not structural biologists who are citing this paper. For the most part, what we've seen, we've seen a lot of computational um, research being done uh, where they cite this paper, um, you know, because they're, they're taking the data and they're using this paper as a citation. And so this paper is among the top 100 papers in science of all time, which is kind of amazing. Um, and then educational resources. Um, you know, we understand that uh, the, there's almost too much information. Uh, supposing you really don't know or want to know anything about uh, structure biology, or you want to know just a little bit, we have a thing called PDB 101. Uh, and you can go in there and learn about uh, different kinds of um, molecules and what they've done. There's a lot of, of paper folding exercises, uh, videos, uh, different kinds of didactic information. Um, when the coronavirus uh, came upon us, uh, the PDB was very, very active in making sure that all the structural data that was being produced uh, on coronavirus uh, constituents was made available prior to publication with permission by the authors, uh, because this, again, like AIDS, uh, is such a, a, a important public health issue that you need to have as much data as you can. And we wouldn't have the drugs and the, and the vaccine if we didn't understand what is going on. And there's a lot of work, especially on the spike protein, you know, those things that are coming out um, that you, you've seen on the, on the virus. Uh, there's a lot of work on that and trying to understand the spike protein. So uh, you can learn more about that by going to the PDB site. Um, and so what I've been trying to um, emphasize here um, is that we're dealing with um, many, when, when you're building a, a data resource that's going to be useful, you have to think about a lot of different things. So the first thing you need to think about is the science. And the science changes with time. So we went from these small proteins, we're now up to these large macromolecular machines and then everything in between. And so as the science changes, the PDB needs to change with the science and be able to accommodate the science. Um, the technology, at the very beginning, if you look at the first column here, here are, for those of you who have never seen a punch card, here it is. Uh, we had these things called diffractometers where we collected one diffraction uh, reflection at a time. Uh, Models were built using brass. Uh, uh, the, there was no uh, computer graphics that we could do in the 70s. Then in the 80s, we have synchrotron radiation, which allows you to get extremely intense uh, beams. We have computer graphics begins to come of age. We have NMR as a method that can be used. Uh, in the 90s, electron microscopy begins to emerge, fast computers and fast detectors. So you can get, you can do bigger structures and you can collect more data. In the 2000s, uh, we had a ribosome structure, it was a big deal. Uh, and we also had the beginning of high, we had high throughput structure genomics. And the point of structure genomics was to get the structure of every protein. Uh, and you, that, that actually is, a, a, that's a long story, which I could explain if anyone wants to hear more about it. But one of the big outcomes of structural genomics is that because we were doing really high throughput crystallography, we needed to have um, better equipment, better machines. So a lot of heavy use of robots. And the result of that is we got a, a huge number of new structures. And then now we're dealing, actually we're gonna to have to add a new column, but in 
starting in 2010, we began to deal with these hybrid integrative methods and where you're looking at uh, structures by many different methods and integrating all of that to get a single model. And then there's the issue of community. So from every step of the way, the community was involved uh, in establishing the archive, um, as I showed you, uh, in establishing the guidelines. This is Fred Richards who got the protein crystallographers to uh, say that everything had to be um, in the uh, PDB and they could, not they, they could not publish unless they did that. Uh, in the 90s, we focused a lot on uh, standardization and uh, actually, and this was the period when the PDB moved from Brookhaven to, um, to New Jersey. And uh, uh, it, it was actually an amazingly smooth transition, although those of us who were in the transition were scared to death that we would lose data or something terrible would happen because it had been in one place for so long. Uh, in the 2000s, we had experimental data being required. The official formation of the WWPDB as a global resource. And then, then we were able to establish validation standards so that um, we could check the data and make sure that it was all good. And again, always involving people who are experts in the field uh, saying, how exactly this should happen. Um, so many years ago, um, I gave this similar talk to a group of um, library scientists and they said to me, are you aware that you're following the guidelines of Eleanor Ostrom? And I said, no. Um, and so they had to educate me. And uh, Eleanor Ostrom won Nobel Prize in 2009. Unfortunately, she passed away in 2012. And she, uh, I went to my colleague, Avi Dixit, who's at Princeton and who I used to have coffee with every morning. And I said, please tell me what, what Eleanor Ostrom said. And what he said is that, uh, and he was a close colleague and friend of hers, that uh, bottom-up collective action could work better than top-down enforcement. And groups devise clear rules what actions are and are not allowed. We have to base it on local conditions and knowledge. We have to be adaptable to changing circumstances. And we have to include organized monitoring and enforcement. And what Avi told me when he, when he described all, he gave me a seminar in his house about what this was all about. And he said, the biggest danger is if you get too big. And I remembered that a lot when, when we were establishing the rules for integrative modeling. I knew that if we tried to take all the primary data from all the methods and put that into the PDB, we would probably crash and burn, which is why we have now a, uh, a federated model for how to do that. So, um, you know, this slide could actually be filled from top to bottom with lots and lots of names, hundreds of names. I'm only giving a kind of the top level. Uh, there are four uh, WWPDB groups uh, that, supposed to be some more, uh, but uh, obviously because of uh, politics and the pandemic, we have to wait. Um, and uh, the funding comes in a, a, a chaotic way to all of us, but luckily we continue to be funded. The heads of the RCSB right now, the, my successor, I, I'm no longer in charge, is Stephen Burley. Uh, Samir Vilankar is PDBE, Genji Kirsu at PDBJ, and now Jeff Hoke at uh, BMRB. Uh, the funding, as I said, comes from lots of places. The PDB Dev, um, the funding is from NSF, and Brenda Vallat and Andre Sali lead that. And EMDR, the funding is from NIH, and that's headed up by Wachu and uh, Kathy Lawson. And then finally, I would like to 
say that we are celebrating our 50th anniversary. Uh, there's going to be an online symposium uh, in May where we will have people from all different uh, fields that have contributed to the PDB uh, giving lectures. Uh, and uh, I would urge you to save the date and hopefully um, be able to come and listen to uh, what I think are gonna be wonderful uh, talks. And so I am happy to answer any questions now. Thank you so much, Helen. What, what a fantastic um, talk. And uh, I really enjoyed seeing the, the history of PDB. Uh, I'll, let me just make a, a comment that those that wanna ask questions, please put it in the chat and we can go through the, those questions. So uh, I'll start off and, and I really think you had pioneering insight over 50 years ago to think about open science for data. And really that was remarkable. I, I think you were 50 years ahead of your, your time. How, how do you see the sustainability of PDB and um, all of the Federation going forward, say another 50 years? That's gonna be, so we're at a, we are at, as they call an inflection point, it's got something very dramatic is happening right this minute. We don't know exactly. So they're gonna to have to be a rethinking of how we do this going forward, because now all of a sudden we may not have as many structures in the PDB. We may have to think about what are we gonna do with all of these predicted structures? So what it requires, I think, is uh, people, and they're gonna be, there's gonna be some Pied Piper out there who's gonna care enough, you know, to kind of keep this going. Um, uh, but that's always an issue. The sustainability has been an issue from the day the PD began, began. okay? But now it may be okay, because now I think we've proven that this was an important uh, thing to do. So do you think this model holds to other areas of science? Um, do you think that we'll see more databases being launched and curated? Ah, that, you know, you know very well that I wish that were true. I think people uh, have a lot of trouble understanding that you don't just make a database and throw the data in, you know, throw it over the fence and forget about it. It's a whole, when I, I remember somebody being, somebody, colleague being extremely critical of me saying, how can you waste your mind on worrying about this stuff? And I said, well, because there's so much to think about. And so when I was in charge of the PDB back when, uh, every day was a, 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 a new intellectual challenge. How we, you know, if you saw one structure that had something really weird, that mean they're gonna be more, that was the canary. There were gonna be more. And um, I think that, that um, people have to understand that. Now, hopefully people like yourself in, in this department, this, this institute, you might be able to, this whole thing about bio curation, setting up databases, making sure the data you're working with is worth something and having some standards for what we mean by that. They've done very well in Europe on that subject. Okay, we have to do it here or borrow from Europe or just steal it or whatever. It's really important. I, I know a, a couple of years ago, you and I served together on NSF's Advanced Cyber Infrastructure Advisory Committee. And we looked at issues such as reproducibility yeah. in, um, for, for data that we use in science. Uh, have your thoughts changed in that area? Uh, as well they haven't changed i mean they've been reinforced that it's so important um and maybe you know maybe we finally have reached a place where people see that if we don't have the data we don't have we don't have what we need you know we don't have drugs to cure disease we don't have uh understand i mean i think that that um i don't know how much you have to show people before they say hey this is really important we haven't done well with the uh, repository issue at all at NSF and NIH, and we have to. 
So there was a, there's a model which says that every experimental um, uh, science, there should be a fraction of the funding that goes into a special place where you then you which you use for archiving the data. And that would be instead of having these competitions and all these crazy things that we have, uh, I don't know if it'll happen. I would love it to happen. Yeah, like you, I was blown away by the CASP news and the, the work that just came out. That was just incredible to see. And I, I'm sure you, you must be proud of, of all the work that you've done on PDB to mm -hmm. get the world there. Yeah. So thank you again for a wonderful talk and we really appreciate it. I, I hope we'll be able to join you May 4th and 5th next year for the 50th anniversary yeah. of, of PDB. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you.